What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked upon, what we touched with our hands, concerns the word of life. For the life was made visible. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim now to you so that you may have fellowship with us, for our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this so that our joy may be complete. Now this is the message. Hello, welcome to episode four of our Lenten scripture study. My name is Garrett Gimbo and I'm joined with Father Mike Pontarelli, the pastor of St. Julianus here in Fullerton. And this is a study where we take 20 minutes to go over uh, the first letter of John, where we just break down the scripture, go through some reflection, and invite you to join us, whether it's at home with a friend or through the comment section on our video. We're super excited today. Today's uh, chapter four. It's a really great chapter, and we're really excited to join and walk with you on this. I just want to remind you that we want to hear from you, so whether it's coming up to us after Mass, whether it's talking to us on the comment section, wherever it may be, we want to talk to you about this scripture and break it open with you. We're, we're on a journey together. Journeying right through Lent to reform our lives and return to the good news of Jesus Christ. With that being said, we're going to go right straight into it, and we'll start off with um, a little prayer and begin reading the fourth chapter. So we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. First letter of St. John, chapter 4. Beloved, do not trust every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they belong to God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ come in the flesh belongs to God, and every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus does not belong to God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist that, as you heard, is to come, but in fact is already in the world. You belong to God, children, and you have conquered them, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They belong to the world. Accordingly, their teachings belong to the world, and the world listens to them. We belong to God, and anyone who knows God listens to us, while anyone who does not belong to God refuses to hear us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might have life through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we must also love one another. No one has ever seen God. Yet if we love one another, God remained in us, and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him, and he in us, that he has given us of his spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son as a Savior of the world. Whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love. And whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. And this is, if, and this is the love brought to perfection among us, that we have confidence on the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love derives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. Whoever does not love a brother whom he hasn't seen cannot love God whom he has seen. This is a commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must love his brother. The word of the Lord. Good and gracious God, send your love on us. Send your love to make us holy and perfect as you are holy and perfect. Send your love on us to transform us so that we may love each other and to love you. Indeed, allow us to fulfill the great commandment, to know, love, and serve you, our Heavenly Father, and to love others as we love ourselves. May all that we do begin with love and continue in that same love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, Garrick, it seems quite obvious that St. John is suggesting that we pause before we believe so that our belief is in the spirit of truth and not the spirit of the world. Interesting, isn't it, that we're surrounded by the world that simply says, go out and do. You know, Nike's motto. I, I'm on a crusade against Nike, not against buying their products and anything else, just, the, just their motto, really. Um, you know, to, to just do it. You can get in an awful lot of trouble by just doing it. And we know that we're best if we pause. Remember the way that Pinocchio was told to pause and give a little whistle? Well, we should pause and give a little prayer to see exactly what it is that we're doing. Are we doing God's will, or are we sort of living another will or another dream, the American dream unbridled? Nothing much wrong with the American dream, except unbridled it can get us in a whole lot of trouble, because it's the language of the world. It's the language that says, the guy with the most toys wins. It's the language that says, nice guys finish last. It's acting without reflection. It's really thoughtless, isn't it? It's, well, everyone's doing it. Well, everyone knows. Well, everyone has one, at least one. Where's mine? This is deception. And don't be deceived. Really think constantly, why am I a Christian? Last week's lesson. I am a Christian so that I can be saved. I am a Christian so that I could love as my Heavenly Father loves. Turn away from the language of the world and turn toward the language of God. Remember that we are certainly people, we are creation in the world, but we shouldn't be of it so much. Isn't that right? Definitely. And in a way, we're reading... The first chapter, this uh, first fourth chapter, and though we've been talking about it a lot, he's really defining what is love. He's dr almost drawing a line in the sand. And are you for love or are you against love? Is your life a reflection of the way that we're called to love God and love others, or are we not doing that? Are we not taking that journey and making those steps? Where are we going in our faith life? And I think as we read this chapter, as I read this chapter, I'm reflecting. Okay, like, am I? living for God or against God? What is, what is it that I'm doing? How does my life reflect his word? Am I living for this world that we've kind of talked about or are we living for the world that God has given us? Isn't love kind of easy? It's huggy bear kissy face, isn't it? Yes and no. I mean, I feel, as again, I reflect on love. It's sometimes so easy to think, okay, uh, I just don't want to get, I don't want to get into fights. I don't want to make everyone upset. I want to just live in harmony with everybody. But at the same time, love is difficult. Love is hard. If my friend is running towards a dead end, I'm going to stop my friend because I know that because I love them, I want to do anything I can to keep them safe, to keep them from doing the wrong thing. Or 
as maybe a, a parent loves their child, if they're running around with a knife or something that's dangerous because you love them, you're going to redirect them, get them to stop what they're doing because you want to protect them. Love is both hugs and kisses or hug, whatever he said, but also it's sacrifice and doing, willing the good of another. So love is service. Definitely. When I think of love in the, in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, and this image you have of, of father, I think of the prodigal son, also the prodigal father, that that kid really had three strikes against him. I mean, he left his family, he left his homeland, and he left his religion. He must have been somewhat afraid. I mean, he had like nothing going for him, and, and he was hungry. And so he comes to his senses, as we're told, but I suppose out of fear that I've got nowhere to go, so I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my father, I don't deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would a slave, a hired hand. And as he's going, he's saying this, and I can only imagine some fear. And what is he met with but love? The dad is just lavish with the kid. He doesn't scold him at all. He doesn't ask for any kind of accounting or where have you been, what have you done, and you bad boy, you, but rather ring, rather robe, rather let's, you know, have a party. And that's just extravagant. And so that love of the father serves the son. That love, of the fam that love of the father serves the family in such a way that life becomes complete, doesn't it? And Jesus is full of love every time he speaks. The woman that's known as, as the, the town sinner isn't scolded. She doesn't have to give a report. I did this how many, so many times with so many different people, and she's not giving any kind of, of penance. Rather, turn away from that sin and live your life fully. There's a word that you do use to describe the prodigal son and the love that he has for, um, the, son, or for the son. You said extravagant. And I don't think it's very often that we think lo God's love is extravagant for me. He extra loves us in an extravagant way that is willing that even if I'm afraid I'm not afraid because there's God's love. There's a particular verse that you kind of meant that we kind of connect to, verse um, 18 in chapter 4. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. And so there becomes this paradox, right? Of do you fear God's love or do you trust God's love? And in the sense that Sometimes we become twisted. If I'm just afraid of hell, I'm afraid of his punishment, I'm afraid of what he might do to me, then that's not really me loving because I'm doing things not out of the motivation of love and for God. I'm doing things for out of the motivation for fear. And I would say that the son coming back to the father, he came from the world and he was filled with fear. But in reality, like he didn't trust that his father might shower him with mercy, with forgiveness, with hope and love, and whatever it might be, but in fact that because he came from the world, I feel like he's coming from a place of fear and a lack of hope, a lack of love, and that's what he was desperately wanting from the Father. Yeah, this whole thing of, of belief, you know, um, believe God's spirit, believe God's way, it, it, it has to do with trust. Believe means trust in, in a certain way. You know, trust that God knows what he's doing and things will fall into place all right. Certainly, Jesus in the garden had to trust that his heavenly father knew what he was doing. Certainly, Isaac had to trust that Abraham knew what he was doing. Certainly, we have to trust that almighty God knows what he's doing with each of us. And we trust because that one definition, God is love. When I was in the, the college seminary, we had a most wonderful professor. 
who was able to give the most wonderful homilies. He even spoke in, in uh, parables. It was just a marvel to listen to. And we knew when he was prepared because he spoke in parables. When he was not prepared, he spoke terribly. And the terrible ones were simple. Gentlemen, I want you all to know and to believe that God is love. That God is love. That God is love. And if you know that God is love and believe that God is love and trust that God is love, you'll not only be really good human beings, but you'll be marvelous priests. So God is love. Let us pray. But remember that God is love and that love doesn't have punishment. We heard yesterday in, in the, the gospel, John, the gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that we won't perish, that we don't have to be afraid anymore, that we have the gift of salvation at our fingertips because we become a new creation, especially in baptism. Remember that at baptism, the prayer, and if you want to know what Catholics believe, listen to the way they pray. You put on Christ in this white gown, see yourself as a new creation. And that's what we're to be, a new creation, putting on Christ, Christ who chooses us and not the other way around. Christ who chooses us for a purpose, the purpose to extend his love to others so that we will be perfect and the world will be perfected by the Christians who love God and one another as they love themselves. Love is the great commandment, isn't it? Yes, and I feel that brings us back to the very beginning that, you know, as love but it may be like whether you're loving or not loving, but it's actually also the hardest thing that we'll probably ever have to do in this life. I think of a quote that as we're kind of talking about this, and it's not my quote, I heard it from a talk somewhere from before, but the journey from the head to the heart is the longest journey that we'll ever take. That though we might understand it, we know what we're supposed to do as Christians, we know what the journey is supposed to be, but I know full and well that it's so difficult. It's so difficult to choose love, to choose to want to be perfect as the Father is perfect. And though that we desire in my heart, and I know I desire it in my heart, it takes a while for my head and my heart to get to the same place. It takes a while for me to decide, okay, though I want this, I, I'm so not always ready to say yes to this. The world is a tempting place. You know, there's another journey or another measure as well for full conversion from the head intellectual conversion, knowing God, the heart, loving God, and then the arms, the legs, and our actions, serving God, to know, love, and to serve. That's complete conversion. And I think that's why we're doing this during Lent. You know, we might ask, why do the first letter of St. John during Lent why not study Job during Lent or some other work? Well, we're told that certainly all scripture can be used for instruction. And the focus, we sometimes forget that the focus is always the love of God and our relationship with God. The focus, I really think, ought to be on, on salvation and the love of God. The focus should not be, in my mind, in my heart and in my actions, the focus should not be on sin. We, I think, have done a marvelous job, as especially Catholic Christians, of, of talking about sin. You've done this wrong how many times? What about talking about salvation? God so loved the world. God is love. Trust the Spirit, the Spirit that raises us up, the spirit that is our salvation, and talk about how good God is and how loving God is, and we will be saved. Really, if we emphasize salvation the same way we've emphasized sin, we'll really be changed. And the point of Lent is to reform our lives and be faithful to the gospel, which ends in our salvation. 
uh, verse 19 in chapter 4. We love because he loved us first. We love because he first loved us. Uh, that's probably one of my favorite uh, verses in this entire book so far, in that the whole point of Lent and everything that we do as Christians is responding to the love that he has given us, responding to the fact that we were created for love, by love, and to love. And so as we reflect on what we're doing and how the direction we're walking, yes, let's not focus on the sin, let's focus on the one who died for our sins. Let's focus on love, the man who's incarnate of love. And so if that becomes our focus, there's no wrong that we can do. There's no misstep that we can take because as long as we keep our eyes on him, everything changes. Everything is made new. You know what changes the most is our life. We come to live life in abundance. John chapter 10, verse 10, the gospel of John, that as you said, we focus on that Jesus died for us so that we can have life in abundance. And that's a very good lesson to remember during Lent too. This whole business of dealing with salvation, putting away fear, and coming back to our baptism, and knowing that God chose us, and we live in him, not for ourselves. Put away the narcissism. Put away the stuff of the world and put on Christ. That pretty much comes to a close on this chapter. I just want to emphasize how much that we've enjoyed, Father and I, doing this uh, series with you. This has um, been so much fun, being able to be in this type of atmosphere, going back and forth, reflecting just on the passage of a Bible. And it's really easy. It's something that, when we again talked about this at the beginning, was we just want to make it accessible. The scriptures is the word of God. It's a place where we can actually hear God speaking to us tangibly. And so we hope that by doing this type of study, we as a parish are able to grow closer to him, especially through the word, whether in the word is everywhere in our mass and our sacraments, it's riddled in everything that we do. And the more that we fall in love with God in the word, it changes everything. What do you call the scripture? God's love letter to us? God's love letter to us. That's a one way, a very powerful way of looking at it. So as always, if you have any comments, any suggestions, we invite you to come talk to us after Mass in the comments section. And I want to add another thing. As we come to a close, we have one more week after this, is let us know what else you want next. We want to do more things like this, whether it's reading another book of the Bible, whether it's talking about a particular topic in the church, whether it's something to do with just our faith and conversion. We want to feed you. We want to journey with you. So please let us know. And we want to do something that's going to interest you, not just what Father and I want all the time too. So please like, subscribe, um, comment below, and we look forward to whatever we have to do next. Garrett, can you close with a prayer? I definitely can. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We love because he first loved us. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so well in our lives, especially through this year, which has been so, had so many ups and downs and crazy things happening. For the things that we've lost and the things that um, sometimes fill us with less hope. But Lord, you are hope. You are everything in our lives and one that we strive for every single day. Help us to love as you love and become perfect as you are perfect. And even if we may fall, even if we may fail, help us to run to you again and again and again. Please continue to sanctify this time, sanctify our hearts, and help us just to have a desire to learn more about you every single day. We thank you so much and to ask you to bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Be sure to say happy birthday to your wife, Father, Garrett. Son, Holy Spirit. Yes. Happy birthday, Kristen, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. God bless.